Welcome to the Refuse Ordinary podcast. I'm your host, Tamara, and I'm so glad you've decided to join us on this journey of discovering who God is and who we are in Him. We are so excited to share with you today another class from our full-time School of Transformation. Today's topic is called Communication with Pharisees, taught by Nathan Taylor. We hope you're both challenged and inspired as you listen to this teaching. So this is a little bit of a fun one, a little bit of a different kind of teaching. This morning we're going to talk about how Jesus' communication with the Pharisees was actually love. Often when we read the, uh, the communications that Jesus had with the Pharisees, we don't tend to feel a whole lot of love in those conversations. He says crazy things like, you whitewashed sepulchers and you brood of vipers and you bunch of hypocrites. And we uh, can really see Jesus, his firm communication with the Pharisees, and you can see his disdain for their behavior, but we often don't attribute any of his interactions with the Pharisees to him being loving. But God calls himself love. And Jesus called himself God. And he says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so there is a lot of love to be found in the communication that Jesus had with the Pharisees, if you know where to look for. It helps to really, you know, kind of familiarize yourself a little bit with the traditions of the Pharisees and kind of know where they were coming from. And one of the really good uh, stories to kind of highlight the traditions that they were in uh, is Mark 7. So why don't everybody flip with me to Mark 7. We're going to read pretty much the whole thing. So it says, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, being Jesus, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do Do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And so there's a lot going on just in this first little bit of the chapter 7. What you see is Jesus is right in the heart of his ministry, in the middle of doing all this stuff. And so at this point, it's very difficult for the Pharisees to deny that he is a man of authority, that he's a man of, of, of really wise teaching. And so, you know, he's already encountered a number, one, a, a number of their challenges against him. He's, they've already tried to trick him with a bunch of questions. And here they are coming 
to observe him again. And it says the scribes came from Jerusalem. And so they, what they were doing is they were sending delegations of, of religious figures, religious Pharisees, and in this case, it calls out the scribes. And so they were the, the learned people within the religious society come from Jerusalem to, to where he's at here to challenge him on the doctrines that he follows. And so there's two things happening here. One, they do want to challenge him, right? And so they're they're going to challenge Jesus, and they think that they have more knowledge than he does to be able to challenge him. And so they're coming to him as his superiors. They're coming as the learned people, and he's... You know, this phenomenon that's happening in the, in the countryside. And two, they're looking to expose him. Either, either to expose him as an imposter, this false messiah, or to expose him as the messiah. Right? It's what, what you find as you read through the Gospels and you see the various different interactions that Jesus has with the Pharisees, that there were a number of Pharisees that were actually hungry to see if Jesus was the Messiah. You got Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3, one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible. Very much the most famous verse in the whole Bible comes from Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee. And so there was, there was a number of them that were quite curious as to whether or not Jesus is for real. And so they're coming to challenge him because they think they know the standards that the Messiah should live by. And they're coming to expose them as either true or false. But the thing that they choose to challenge him on is this tradition of, of cleansing, washing the hands, washing the pots, washing the stuff. And they completely miss everything else that's going on around them, right? Jesus is and we're going to read on and see some more stuff, but Jesus is healing the blind, the lame, the deaf. He's multiplying food in front of them. You know, he just he had just done the seven thousand or the five thousand, and he just in Mark's gospel he just walked across the water to get to where he is, and they're missing all of these other signs that nobody can do except for God. These are all the the check mark boxes that the Messiah must check in order to be the Messiah. He's doing all of the stuff and they get distracted by the fact that his disciples aren't washing their hands. And they don't say that Jesus isn't washing their hands. They say the disciple isn't washing washing their hands. And so they've kind of missed it. And so he gets on them. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites? And everybody everybody reads you hypocrites and instantly we're like, yes, the Pharisees are about to get it. Let's and we, you know, we imagine them as a bunch of stuck up old stuffy religious guys, right? And so let's read on and then we'll come back. So verse nine, it says, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, 
and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And so immediately he kind of sets the scene for them. You know, right? Remember, they've come to challenge and expose him. And he sets the scene. He says, okay. He doesn't deny that his disciples should be washing their hands. He's not like, you know, comes against the tradition as being wrong. You know, what he what he does is, listen, if this is the scale that we are going to judge each other by, then let's let's be on the same page. You want you want to judge my disciples by this scale. That's fine. Go ahead. Let's put you on the same scale that we're judging. It's the, that's where that you hypocrites come from. Is this. This demand of, of the law, this demand of justice, of judgment that you want to place on my disciples, you avoid it for yourself. It's the, they were too proud and too blind to see it for themselves. And often we read these and we're like, yeah, way to go, Jesus. Get them. Roast them. But what I've discovered over my time really searching my own heart and through the years I've been in various ministries, it's far too often we are more like the Pharisees than the disciples. We like to put ourselves in the category of the disciples or the, you know, Sometimes, you know, we'll put ourselves in the category of the prostitutes and the tax collectors. You know, Jesus went and had dinner with them. And, you know, it seems like it's a pretty low bar to get into that dinner party. So we're like, yeah, I'm getting into that one. But the truth is far, far too often we're actually approaching Jesus to challenge him. We're approaching Jesus to expose him. So what they did is they had the first volumes of the law, right? They had the instructions of Moses, Mm -hmm. which, you know, the original was the original 10, Mm -hmm. right? The two little iPads he came down from the mountain with, two tablets. And that should have been enough. But they're like, well, how do we handle this situation? How do we handle that situation? So then Aaron and Moses got together and started to expand upon the ten with with the help of God. And then they had this huge first volume of the law. How do you live out these ten? And then what happened over the thousands of years of them trying to live out the the 10 is they kept creating and creating and creating all of these scenarios in which they'd have to address specific scenarios and they come up with all of these excuses as when they're supposed to follow the 10 and when they're not supposed to follow the 10 or when when they have an excuse to bend it a little bit and when they don't have an excuse to bend it a little bit and so if there's ever a time that you should be excused from washing your hands, it's when you're ministering to the poor, the sick, and the hungry. Right? But these, again, the, the Pharisees came to challenge and to expose. And so Jesus is now challenging them and exposing them. 
And I don't think that it felt too good. <laughs> Especially for the scribes. I don't I, I forget exactly where Jesus is at. It probably says it clearer in one of the other gospels. But the the scribes came all the way from Jerusalem. We're we're talking at least a couple days' journey to come and catch Jesus here. And the first thing that they challenge him on, he nails him to the wall. <laughs> and they're guilty. And we all go, yeah, way to go, Jesus. Right? But what I've seen in my own life, my own heart, my own journey with many, many people, is that we quite often come to him challenging. We probably aren't challenging about hand washing, right? Because we're not about we're not a bunch of ancient Jews or modern day Americans, most of us. But, you know, we come challenging Jesus based on our own traditions. How about tithes and offerings? Oh, 10%. That's such a religious thing. That's such a religious tradition. I'm a, I'm a New Testament Christian. I don't need to. Or, you know, Jesus, he's, a re- he's right about ready to tell us what defiles us. Why don't we read that real quick? <laughs> Verse 14, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going into him defiles him, but the things that come out of a person are what to defile him. Okay. I am not by any means innocent of this, but you know how many arguments I've heard of for the permission of cussing and foul language and and just hate coming out of our mouths against other people that have have hurt us. Jesus right here says that defiles us. And you know, I hear all I hear all arguments all the time. Well, that's just you know that's just how I talk to my family. That's just how I express myself. That's just uh, I didn't mean it. I was just venting. We explain away. We challenge the very things that he came to teach. The very things that he came to to show us. And we challenge it based on our traditions. You look at our culture. You know, that's so archaic. You know, waiting for marriage. Waiting, keeping yourself pure. Or how about how about denying people the ability for same-sex attraction and same-sex marriage? Or, you know, all the flavors of the rainbow with the LGBTQ. It's you know, wouldn't it be love to let people just embrace who they love? Right? Challenge, <laughs> challenging Jesus. There was this billboard, I don't know how long, a couple of years ago, not that long ago. It was paid for by Gavin Newsom. He, he supported it. I don't know if it was something that he ran on or something. There's a billboard down south somewhere that said need an abortion we can help and then at the bottom it said for God is love Hmm. and then I'm struggling for the address but I'm I'm trying to find 
in my brain where it's that it's the verse where it says God is love. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. And if that isn't our culture trying to warp what Jesus was saying, I, I don't know a better example of it. Because just like just like the Pharisees were going, they were missing the point and they were going to Jesus to challenge them, challenge him based off of their own preconceptions and their own traditions and expose him based on their own biases. They wanted to expose him to either be or not be the Messiah based on what they wanted the Messiah to look like. And these guys had a lifetime of studying their biases, a lifetime of studying their traditions. They're skillfully, say it again, skillfully sidestepping the... Skillfully sidestepping God's law in order to hold on to it. They had a lifetime of being taught how to skillfully sidestep God's law to hold on. And we do too, absolutely. And so what is going to wake them up out of their tradition? What is going to shake them out of this lifetime of being bound by this law, this hypocrisy? In another story, Jesus is at the temple and... uh, he uh, sits down and he observes the money changers. And he's sitting there for a while, it seems like. And he's observing the money changers and, and the, the, the Pharisees and the priests coming and going through the outer courts of the temple. And he picks up some stuff and he starts to fashion a whip. He says, Jesus fashioned a whip. And I don't know how long it took to fashion the whip, but he started fashioning the whip. And he, he goes into the court where the, where the money changers and the, the merchants that are selling the sacrifices and starts whipping people. <laughs> Throwing tables over. It wasn't an outburst of anger. It wasn't an outburst of ah, crazy. It was calculated. It was, you know, he at least had the time it took to fashion the whip to consider what he was about to do. And we know that Jesus was without sin. Perfect. And so he, you know, it was very calculated. And I'm sure it was a very busy day and there was a lot of people watching this and nobody came and arrested him. Nobody came and seized him on that day. If there was any day that they should have seized Jesus and arrested him, it should have been the day that he was flipping t- tables at the temple. Why did nobody arrest them on that day? Because they all knew what they were doing and what was wrong. They all knew the hypocrisy that was happening, the, the absolute thievery that was happening on the door front, the door steps to the temple. And so Jesus goes on. <laughs> Think after uh, after he sends the Pharisees away, he says it says he entered a house and left the people. His disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, "Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him?" since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within, uh, from within, out of the heart of a man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, 
wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all evil things come from within and they defile a person. Right? And that's what the Pharisees had missed. All of these holy, righteous acts were happening right in front of their eyes. The mercy of God was intersecting with earth and people were being healed, set free, and delivered right in front of them. I long for that to happen in our time right now, you know, the, the doubters, right in front of the doubters, right in front of the skeptics, right in front of the challengers of the faith. These people were being healed, set free, and delivered. And if the Pharisees had have said, Jesus, you're, you and your disciples are doing all of these things, but... Peter still struggles with pride and foolishness. How is this possible? I think Jesus would have sat them down and had a real honest conversation and discussion. You know, well done, Pharisees and scribes. Let me explain how my mercy and how how my grace covers Peter's foolishness and his pride. And as, as it's revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, he changes and he grows. And, you know, just the other week I, I rebuked him and I said, get behind me, Satan. And in a couple more months, I'm going to warn him that he's going to, def- he's going to deny me three times and it's going to break his heart and he's going to go back to his old life. But then I'm going to come find him and I'm going to renew him and I'm going to redeem him so that He becomes a man that good things come out of. And he's no longer prideful and foolish. And you too can be delivered from your pride and your foolishness. Could have had an honest conversation. But they wanted to focus on hand washing. And so he shocks them with this abrupt, aggressive comment. You hypocrite. Right after this, Mark puts this contrasting story that just fits so perfectly here. And it's the story of of the Syrophoenician woman. It's one of of the most interesting stories in in the Gospels for me. Because it's just, I, I try and I try and I try to put myself in her shoes to see how I would react. And I... I just don't know. And so it says, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know yet. He could, But he could not be hidden. Immediately a woman whose little daughter had un, an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphonician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And we just take that that statement, we put it in contrast with the Pharisees. I almost feel like this one's more insulting. It's not right for me to give the children's bread to the dogs, you dog. It just doesn't fit my theology of who he is. Uh, yeah, the fluffy, gentle Jesus. I can see him talking to the Pharisees, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers, you religious stuffy people. I can, I can see him talking to them like that, but this woman who's desperate to have his, her daughter healed, and here's Jesus calling her a dog, it doesn't fit my bias. It doesn't fit my perception of who Jesus is supposed to be. And so theologians and very smart people have 
explained away the insult of the statement by saying, oh, it was a common phrase that the Jews used to describe Gentiles, dogs. They just called Gentiles dogs all the time. Okay, it might have been common, just like the N-word was common in slavery. It doesn't make it any more pleasant. We're Gentiles. Yeah, or even just (laughs) calling them Gentiles. It doesn't make it any more pleasant to this woman who's desperate to have her daughter healed. It, there's no pleasant way to receive that, even if it was common. He's calling her a dog. That same reaction that I get for the Pharisees isn't the reaction I get when I read this. I'm not like, way to go, Jesus. Get her. Get her. Nail her. Yet this woman was probably just as guilty or more guilty of being defiled than the Pharisees. She's a Gentile. She hasn't followed any of the law. She hasn't even attempted. Well, we don't know. But most likely, she hasn't attempted to, to follow any of the law because she's not a Jew. And so she's just as defiled. And it, so Jesus is right in both cases calling them defiled the Pharisees, and this woman. What's different, the only thing that's different is the reaction she has versus the reaction the Pharisees have. And so her reaction gets me every time. He says, but she answered him, yes, Lord. Not But you don't know what I've gone through. Or, how dare you? Or, I'm not as bad as you think. Or, let me offer up all the excuses I have. I'm not, I wasn't born in a Jewish household. How should I have to know the law? How should I have to follow your traditions? No, she just says, yes, Lord. In the eyes, in in the comparison to you, I am absolutely a dog. There's, There's just no comparison. Call me a dog if you have to call me a dog. Just have mercy on me. Just take mercy on me. And she says, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So she, she came not to challenge Jesus. She came not to expose Jesus. She came to reveal him. Even the dogs find mercy at his table. Even the outcasts the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the Gentiles, find mercy at his table. But see, his his response is so interesting. It says, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. For this statement. It's basically just... You know, for this reaction, because you didn't have to prove yourself to me, because you didn't come challenging me from a place of self-righteousness like the Pharisees came. You came from a place of humility. Saying, you know, call me a dog if you have to call me a dog. But I know that I know that you are merciful. I know that you are kind. I know that even the dogs can eat crumbs from your table. And a crumb from your table, that's enough to heal my daughter. See, she got what the Pharisees didn't get. Both both 
her and the Pharisees were insulted by what Jesus said to them. I really doubt that she felt good after he called her a dog. She probably for a minute felt like this big. But she allowed that statement to shake her and build her faith. She didn't rise up in self-righteousness to, to argue against Jesus. She allowed him to just, with that statement, heal her, heal her daughter. Titus says this, or Paul's letter to Titus says this interesting statement that kind of puts what Jesus said in these two stories in contrast to the kind of, you know, fluffy, kind Jesus that we tend to lean on. It says in Titus 3, 4, when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. See, the Pharisees were not willing to let go of their self-righteousness through their tradition. They were not willing to let go of their arguments that they were challenging Jesus on. And so what they get is when Jesus is on the hill about to enter into Jerusalem for the crucifixion, he laments over Jerusalem saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. And then he reveals the great and awful curse that's about to fall on them when Jerusalem is conquered and taken over by Rome and the dispersion happens. They missed it. They missed the day of their visitation because they were unwilling to let go of their challenge, to let go of their self-righteousness, <coughs> to let go of their tradition. And so for us, again, you know, I said, you know, we read these stories and even today it's like, I don't naturally want to associate with the Pharisees. I, I view them as the bad guys and I view myself as the good guy. But I know I have had traditions that I have not been so willing to give up. I know that I've had biases and cultural preferences that I've not been want, willing to give up until he shook me. You know, he woke me up either through just me stepping in it and realizing how stupid I was for believing the things that I believe. You know, when I when I withhold withheld my my tithe and my offering from him. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's tight. And you, we want to say, you know, it'll be you know, just let things get caught up and it'll be, it'll be better. And he just says, calls it what it is. He says, that's distrust. That's independence. You think, like we've been reading from Malachi, you think that, you know, that's not robbing from me? It is robbing from me. And then we want to justify, based on our traditions, we want to skillfully sidestep God's law. And we say, you know, 
you don't need my money anyways. You're God. You have cattle on a thousand hills. And it's easy, easy to justify. Why does he need our money? He's the breather of stars, the creator of planets. Why does he need my money? Easy to explain away. But he says, it's not, you're not robbing me of the physical money. You're robbing me of the opportunity to pour out the blessings that I want to pour out on you through it. Just like if this woman had have said, how dare you call me a dog? Forget you. I knew this was too good to be true. He can't be loving if he's calling people a dog. He can't be a healer. He can't be the Messiah if he's calling people a dog. How ridiculous is this? She stormed off. She would have never got the miracle she got for her daughter. But she didn't. She stayed. And she got what she came to Jesus to get. And so some questions to consider. What is your religious tradition? It might not be religious in the way that you think it's religious. You know, it might not be like Roman Catholic Church religious. It might be, you know, I grew up in Butte County and this is the way that we live in Butte County religious. Or it might be, this is the thing that my grandmother taught me, or this is the thing that my uncle taught me, or this is the thing that I learned in Sunday school that I'm just not willing to let go of. What is your tradition? You know, you know it's a tradition that's of man and not of God when you, when you have to become skillful at sidestepping what you which you are challenged by Jesus to confront. Just like the Pharisees had the challenge from God and then they had to, from Jesus, and they had to get skillful at arguing him and try and create these traps for him to fall into. Number two, who are we trying to expose Jesus to be? What are, the th- what are the things we want to challenge Jesus on? Where do we want to sidestep? It's okay if I lie a little bit. It's okay if I don't give everything. It's okay if I, you know, get close to the line of immorality by the movies I watch, the shows I watch. It's okay if I cuss, you know. Who are we trying to expose Jesus to be? Number three, what is our agenda for Jesus? The Pharisees did want the Messiah to be exposed. There was, there was a, a group of them that really wanted the Messiah to be Jesus. As long as Jesus fit their agenda. And their agenda, number one, was getting autonomy from the Romans. They didn't want to be under Roman control anymore. They wanted the great and powerful, mighty nation of Israel to be restored. And so if they could provoke him to use the same power that he was using to heal the blind and heal the lame and heal the sick to fight the Romans, they were all for him being the Messiah. And so when it comes to the Seraphonician woman, you know, her agenda was getting her daughter healed, right? But what got her healed was her willingness to accept him as Lord, despite the fact that he just totally insulted her. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm, in, I'm hurt. I'm frustrated. I'm insulted by Jesus. Insulted by Jesus. Just let that sentence seep in for a little bit. But she got what she came there for. So our agendas, not all of our agendas are bad, but it's important that we come to Jesus 
for who he is. If we're, if we're looking to get something from him, we need to come to him for who he is. The Pharisees were coming to Jesus to be the warrior king, defeat the Romans. That's not who he was going to be. He came with, he came with peace. He came with mercy. They wanted him to come with justice and wrath. That's not who he was. So he's, they're not going to get what their agenda was for him. And then this one, we didn't talk too much about it, but ultimately the Pharisees put Jesus to death. They wanted to stop his message, kill his message. And if we don't, address these questions in ourselves ultimately we end up killing parts of jesus's message in our life that's when we start turning the page when we don't agree with the challenge that he's put in front of us say let's move on to the next one let's move on to the something that's easier to hear i don't like discipline so i'm going to turn the page i don't like being called a dog so i'm going to turn the page i don't like giving and trusting with my money so i'm going to flip the page We start killing parts of his message because we avoid the difficult things he's he's saying to us. And ultimately, remember, how can we rob God? What are we robbing God of? Nothing physical. All we're robbing God of is his opportunity to love us, pour out his love on us. These disciples that, again, he didn't argue with the Pharisees that they were guilty of not washing their hands. They didn't wash their hands. And then he spits off this whole list of things that they were still wrestling through. There was a thief in the twelve. There was a murderer. Peter took his sword up at the end and cut a servant's ear off. If he had hit just a little bit closer to the head, he probably would have killed the servant. There was still a violent man in Peter. We don't know about sexual immorality and adultery and coveting and slenderness, but I'm, I'm assuming that there was one of the twelve was struggling with each of these things. He wasn't nailing them to the cross and calling them a bunch of hypocrites for following him. How dare you follow me, Peter? Well, you still have murderous thoughts in your heart and foolishness and pride. How dare you? No. As he was exposing himself to them and challenging them, they allowed him to say difficult things to him. Peter allowed Jesus to say, get behind me, Satan. And ultimately, the 11 became something spectacular, right? Because they allowed these difficult things to seep in, and they didn't get offense, allow offense to build up in their hearts. Thank you for listening to this episode of Refuse Ordinary. We hope you were encouraged, inspired, and even challenged to seek more of who God is and who you are in Him. If you have any questions about the School of Transformation or would like to apply for our next semester, please go to transformationschool.org or send us an email at info at transformationschool.org. See you next time.